my name is Robert Ead and I lead Health and Social Care at Policy Exchange. Um, thank you very much for coming along to today's event, which is in partnership with Palantir, and it is titled Envy of the World, How Can We Deliver a Leading Health and Social Care System After the Pandemic? Now, every few years, an organisation called the Commonwealth Fund ranks 11 high-income healthcare systems, and in 2017, the NHS came top. And it also was listed as first for care processes, things like prevention and safety and coordination, but also it came top on equity of access. But if you fast forward to early this summer, the NHS has slipped to fourth overall, behind Norway, Netherlands and Australia. And we're now also near the bottom when it comes to healthcare outcomes and concerningly have also slipped down in access to care. So what's gone wrong and how do we put it right? That is what we are here today to explore. So I'm going to invite each of our speakers in turn to um, provide their initial thoughts or actions before we throw it out to questions. So um, first of all, I'd like to invite Karen Smith, who's the Member of Parliament um, for Bristol um, South, um, and also a member of the Health and Care Committee, which is currently scrutinising the, um, the legislation which is going through the Commons. So Karen. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Nice to be uh, in person, as other people have said, and thanks for inviting me to Policy Exchange today. So. Um, First of all, I think basically you have to decide if you want to be number one in the world, and we might want to discuss whether we do want to be number one or, um, uh, you know, those other health systems are very good health systems. But I think the measures that they use around universal coverage, invest in primary and community care, uh, reducing administrative burdens and investing in social services, particularly around children, are exactly the, right, the ones that we should be considering. The key thing for me is you have to decide if you want to pay for it to be uh, number one. And as we move to 40% of revenue spending um, over the next few years, we really need to understand what we're spending our money on, and we really have to be able to justify it to the taxpayer because uh, as a constituency MP, that level of spend is really squeezing out a number of other really important and difficult issues. For me, and I've always been very strong on this, that's about the taxpayer knowing and understanding what the service uh, delivers. Um, and influencing what you get for your money. And I think the service needs to be able to explain that to people and people should have some power in the system, a much stronger a voice, much more local accountability from what is an over-centralised uh, system long overdue for reform at that level. And for me, better governance at all levels is really key. We need stability of funding, we need longer term settlements, and particularly as we look at revenue, we also need to look at capital. And capital is something we very rarely consider, and it's also not the sort of thing that inspires people here at Labour Party conference to get overexcited about the health and social care, but it is really key. I think the health and care bill is a missed opportunity. We've said it's the wrong bill at the wrong time. Um, and I'm, I'm a backbench MP, so I don't speak formally for the Labour Party, but I do think it is a missed opportunity. What we're seeing in these new organisations, I've called them cartels. They are a mix of local commissioners and very strong, powerful, uh, acute providers. There is no local accountability in that system. Um, as we move towards um, this collaborative model to be welcomed, uh, as we get rid of competition, very expensive competitions and the barriers that that produced, again, to be welcomed. There's a real problem about having no external force or pressure in the system. And this is something, for those of you that are following the micro detail of the Hansard debates on the bill, which are all available online, that, that certainly I've been pushing and I've been putting down amendments to. As a Labour Party, we put forward the idea of having an elected local chair we had some fascinating evidence from Sir Robert Francis about external push on the system in order to uh, give a much be uh, better public voice. We've moved away from autonomy in the system and competition, but what's replacing that in this new collaborative model? I think that's a real problem for the future. There's also no sense of priority setting in the health and care bill, and there's absolutely no grip on recovery. We know we're going to get another bill, so we'll all be back here again uh, in a few months' time. Um, in terms of where we are now, um, and the pandemic, I do think there's an opportunity to bag some of the gains from the pandemic. Um, I spent, I was a former NHS manager and one of my jobs 10 years ago was trying to bring in um, remote dermatology services um, from a private sector provider to get GPs and primary cares to look at photographs on these cameras that were coming in at the time. It was like trying to get people to go to Mars. And also one of my other jobs was try to improve uh, telephone uh, conversations from GPs getting the GP to want to do telephone consultations, getting the practices able to uh, free up slots and reorientate the rotor and the appointment system was also, again, like 
trying to go to Mars um, and um, demonstrating that it was worth having telephone conversations or using this newfangled internet to do things. I think it's phenomenal. I mean, we've got a real problem with access uh, and perceptions of access. We know that healthcare is a lot about reassurance. People do feel that they want to see somebody. That is true, particularly for children and some older people. But the, um, the use of technology, the use of remote access, the use of the telephone, I think is really exciting um, uh, uh, going forward. And finally, and I've just caught the end of Jonathan's speech, but um, in where we are now, um, Jonathan's talked a lot about poverty and health inequalities. It's what got me interested in health care services from, for those who are old enough to remember, the Black Report in the 1980s. The health service has never delivered on health inequalities. The lack of public health uh, spending uh, and the cuts to public health in the last 10 years has made that worse. And, and we should be ashamed of that. We should be ashamed after 70 years of a publicly funded welfare system that health inequalities are so bad. Many of us understand that's about wider determinants, but that's really where we need to be thinking about in the future as well. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'd now like to go to Sean Walsh, who is Head of Public Affairs and Campaigns at Cancer Research UK. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, so how do we world leading, the envy of the world. Um, I'll address this through a cancer lens, but I think a lot of these points are relevant across the health and social care system. So I guess to think about where we are now, and obviously the pandemic has had a significant impact on patients, families, those providing care and services in the NHS. We know at Cancer Research UK that 37,000 people who should have started cancer treatment in the past year didn't. And there are a number more stats that support that. So it's a real challenge. The real problem is that this was a challenge, and I think Jonathan mentioned this in his speech, this was a challenge before the pandemic. So before the pandemic, we had the worst 62-day cancer waiting times on record. That hasn't been hit since 2015. So I really want to make sure that the debate and discussion is about how do we resolve where we are now, but also recognise that this was a challenge before and it's therefore something we need to do more than just build back better. We need to build back even better. That's a terrible phrase, and I want to use that again. Um, in terms of cancer, what does it mean? Well, we're part of an international cancer benchmarking uh, project that does compare and contrast and look to see how well cancer services are faring in the UK. And sadly, cancer survival in this country rates very poorly towards the bottom of that table when you look at other countries and other comparable systems. And there's reasons for that, which I'll come on to in a, in, in a second. Why is this important? Well, one in two of us, sadly, will get cancer. The good news is that we've doubled survival from cancer in the last 40 years. So there is hope, but the hope is dependent upon investment, which is always going to be the answer to your question about being world-leading. The other thing I would say is that the key thing with cancer, at least, and a number of other conditions, is early detection and early diagnosis. The government has a target that 75% of cancer should be diagnosed early by 2028. We are nowhere near that. It's a really good target. We need to keep the target, but we're around 55%. And the reason why we're struggling is because of resource. And I'll come to now to sort of three key points, I think, which I'll briefly touch on, Robert, in, in relation to this, this question. So firstly, we need to see an investment in workforce and kit. Yeah, Pre-pandemic, one in 10 posts in the NHS were vacant. In simple terms, there's just not enough people working in the NHS to diagnose cancer soon enough. And therefore, treatment options are limited. There's not enough kit. You talked about capital, and we know that there are far fewer MRI and CT scanners in the NHS compared to other OECD countries. We're at the bottom of that table as well. There is a Richards review on diagnostic services, which maps out a really good, pragmatic, sensible way forward but this all requires investment. Second thing I'll just draw attention to is investment in science and research. You know, science and research is going to take us through this pandemic. You know, it is going to take us to a brighter place. And as with the pandemic, as with cancer, and as with dementia and other conditions, investment in science and research is absolutely key. So I'm really pleased to hear the Labour policy about 3% commitment 3% of GDP commitment to, to, to um, science and research, and obviously the government have their own commitment of uh, 22 billion, I think, in, in, in coming years, which is really, really positive, because this research delivers breakthroughs. It makes a difference. 
we have evolved, we have improved, and as I said, you know, doubled the rate of cancer survival. Other conditions will have their own stories to tell. And then finally, very briefly, I don't think we can talk about being world leading without picking up on the point that you made around public health, prevention, and health inequalities. Um, we know four in 10 cancers are preventable. You know, if we're able to reduce smoking, if we're able to live healthier lives, then the burdens on the health system become less. And that allows the health system then to do the other things it should be there to do and not be a sickness service, but actually kind of help people. In relation to inequalities, 30,000 cancer cases are attributable to deprivation. That's really challenging. And whilst the government has an ambition for the UK to be, or England to be smoke free by 2030, Cancer Research UK estimates we're not going to hit that till 2037. And if you look at some parts of the country, that's another decade on from there as well, because we know that smoking and obesity is much higher in more deprived communities. So in sum, the recent funding by the government from the NHS and social care was welcome, but it's not enough. It doesn't address these points and some of the structural points that we know are really, really important. The health and care bill doesn't address a number of these issues, although we welcome the measures in there around obesity. Some of the broader issues around workforce aren't addressed. So the forthcoming spending review has to be the opportunity to make these investments to address these issues um, because we know, and we know painfully through this pandemic, that cancer won't wait. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. And you also give me a good opportunity to plug some recent policy exchange research on, the, on investment in diagnostics. So we've called for 1.3 billion to be announced at the next spending review to bring us in line with OECD average. Um, and we would support that. <laughs> thank you, Sean. That's very good to hear. Um, can we now please turn to Fiona Carragher, who is Director of Research and Influencing at Alzheimer's Society. Fiona. Uh, thank you, Robert. And um, good, good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to make three kind of key points for all aligned around dementia. Um, dementia affects about 850,000 people in this country and that number is set to rise but first myth I want to bust it is not an inevitable part of aging it is a pathology it is caused by disease so things like Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia are the main causes of um, dementia in this country and at the moment we do not have any drugs that will stop or slow progression of this disease so the majority of the care that people will get will be from our social care system However, there are some glimmers of hope. The first drug approved by FDA in recent weeks called aducanumab is slowly making its way through the regulatory authorities in Europe and in the UK. Um, and so we are beginning to see some breakthroughs in research in this field. So three points I want to make. The first is around the research agenda. Um, I've been a scientist for the majority of my career in the NHS, and I have seen at first hand the huge breakthroughs we've seen in diagnosing and treating cancer, cardiovascular disease, and others. And in some ways, it, it makes sense that dementia has been the one that has, has been left behind because the brain is the most complex organ, and it is incredibly difficult to investigate and look. But what we need are the best and brightest scientists to come into this field. Because at the moment, for every pound that's spent in cancer research, only about 30p is spent in dementia research. So we know the government has made a commitment to doubling dementia research, and I was really pleased to hear John Ashworth in, only in the last half hour, and I hot-fitted it along from, from listening to his speech to say that the Labour Party will also honour this commitment to double dementia research, because we need this. We need understanding of diagnosis and we need understanding of treatments for the future. The second point to make is around integration. Now, dementia is the most common condition that cuts across health and social care. So at the moment, we have very few medical treatments. We've got very few drugs that can be given. We've got some psychosocial interventions like cognitive uh, behavioral therapy. But the majority of care that's, that's given for people with moderate and severe dementia is through our social care system. And as many of you in this room will know, it is a huge, huge challenge. So the com complexity of a dementia as a condition means that we have to integrate um, care across health and social care, but also across primary care, our acute trusts, and our mental health trusts. Because at the moment, the dementia pathway is absolutely fragmented and not given the personalised care that someone with dementia needs. And what we hear every day is that personalisation is incredibly important. So this is not just about being able to feed or dress or helping with eating, this is about what matters to the individual with dementia. 
And that will mean that people can live in the place that they call home and not necessarily um, have the support that they need. We also know that technology, it would be very interesting to hear from other uh, panellists on this, is that technology can play a real, um, a real part in this because we don't believe that technology will, will ever uh, replace an individual and that care and support that's needed. But actually, there's some real opportunities around digital assistance, around use of sensors and beds and toilets and fridges that mean that people can live independently for as long as possible in their own home, and that's what's needed. Which comes finally to the bit about social care reform. Because even with the benefits of technology and even with research and innovation, we need to have a suitably reformed care system that, that will really support people with dementia. Now, we welcomed the Health and um, Care Bill because it actually started the conversation about social care reform. But we're very clear that funding is not the only step here. We have to focus on the issues of quality and on access. And we have to see a clear plan for what social care reform is looking like. And that's something that we have yet to see from the government. And we have to have urgent clarity on what, that, what those changes will be. And for us, it's issues not just of the funding, but issues of the workforce. And we've heard this a lot through the last couple of days, how the workforce needs to be transformed so we can put things on a much, much clearer footing for the future. So from a dementia perspective, how do we get a leading health and care system? We need to be ambitious in the use of research and innovation. We need to properly integrate, and I take Kate's points really well. You know, this can't just be about the NHS. This has to be about integration across health and social care. And thirdly, it's about social care reform, really putting what matters to people who use the system at the heart of the reforms that's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, in Karen's opening remarks, she said it was like getting a rocket ship to Mars. Um, what's it like doing digital transformation and working with the NHS, Louis? It'd be great to hear your thoughts. Is it still like rocket science? Um, thank you, Rob, and thank you for that starter question. Um, uh, I'm Louis, Louis Mosley. I lead Palantir in the UK. Um, we're a software company that provides uh, information technology to large, complex organisations, uh, ranging from Airbus to the World Food Programme. But over the last 18 months, we've been working very closely with the NHS and supporting the NHS with their COVID response. And that has given me something of a, I suppose, a ringside seat um, for those events and also some insight into what I think are some of the coming challenges uh, for the NHS that we've touched on already on the panel. Um, I think politics is not my place, but maybe if I could start with a quick political observation. Uh, coming in as someone who you know, had used the NHS as a citizen but wasn't familiar with its inner workings. Um, one of the striking things that I think that the, the challenge with productivity in healthcare systems around the world has been an issue for decades. Since the 90s, um, I guess starting with the Tory governments but continued by New Labour and on into the Cameron years, the, the diagnosis of that productivity problem was a lack of competition. And I think coming into the NHS, the observation that I'd make is the fundamental challenge to that productivity uplift is actually a lack of integration. It's the fact that it's very centralized, as, as, as Karen said, but also fundamentally fragmented into hundreds of separate organizations that run somewhat autonomously. And this creates enormous challenges for, particularly for sharing information, and to tackle some of these big challenges, like the elective backlog and, and others that no doubt we'll discuss, we're going to need much, much better information sharing across the system as a whole. That's between primary care, secondary care, community care, but also within hospitals themselves. Uh, different floors, different specialties. Um, and this is, uh, this is something that I think is a deep lesson of the experience of COVID. For example, the vaccination program, which our, our software played a role in supporting, that required the NHS in its entirety to come together uh, organizations that, and specialties and groups that had previously been fragmented needed to work in harmony very, very fast. They needed to stand up infrastructure, do things in weeks that had never been done before. And I think that shows it's possible. Uh, it can be done. And some of that needs to be bottled and captured and taken forward. And I think at its core, it is, it is about better integration, better sharing of information. And I think just to also touch on something I thought, Karen, you mentioned very interesting about the challenge with accountability. 
I think better information sharing can also lead to better accountability because once you have that information shared, it's collected, it's captured in real time, it's available for everyone within the healthcare system, why not then open up a new era of open data and make that information available to the wider public? Provide that transparency into the local integrated care systems and the different levels of the NHS. How are they performing? Are they serving us in the way that we expect? And could information be part of the answer to that accountability challenge? Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Thank you Louis. Um, now, we'll, I'm keen to bring people in for questions, but um, I thought I'd ask one just to get us going. Um, obviously, we are here at Labour Party Conference, and we know that the NHS is going to be one of the defining issues in the general election, whether that's in 2023 or 2024. Um, where does Labour sit on the NHS debate? We've just had a speech from the Shadow Health Secretary who's been in post for many years. There's some exciting stuff around additional research and innovation and some work around prevention, but do we think that Labour has got enough of the policy initiative um, and has the kind of right vision for the health service that can persuade voters to back them in the next election? Um, Karen, would you like to maybe just share some thoughts on that first? Um, well, obviously the answer to that question is yes. Um, I'll stop there, shall I? Um, <laughs> I think, um, uh, I mean, and you've got some, some of those pointers from, from Jonathan, and I think, I think he has over the last year talked a lot about drug and alcohol services, prevention more, more widely. Um, and I think putting prevention, public health front and centre is absolutely where we are. I think that's true in the pandemic. I mean, uh, you know, he talked about poverty today. It's true, you know, a hungry child can never be a healthy child. So that sense of um, uh, local government, be more local, bringing together those determinants of health, I think is very much front and centre of where we are all thinking. Because again, in the pandemic, and this is true, I think for most of my colleagues, if, if you didn't know your public health director before the pandemic, I mean, I did because I used to work with her for 20 odd years, um, then you certainly knew them afterwards. So, and I think that's true across the political, uh, political spectrum for, for, for conservative colleagues as well. So there's a much better understanding amongst parliamentarians, I would say, about public health and what happens locally. People know where vaccine uptake was good and bad. They know where the virus went and people ask questions from that. So that's, again, learning that we need, that, that everyone needs to bag. I, I mean, to be, you know, slightly controversial, I think I've, I've always been in a slightly different place sometimes to my Labour colleagues. Um, I think, you know, Bevan was right to nationalise the health service centrally. I think we would have had this hodgepodge of services all around. But I've long felt that, um, uh, and we did this in government partly with service standard frameworks and so on, that you have to have all of this much more local. You, you have to have that grip in the system for accountability. You know, data, honesty about the money is, is part of that. Because unless people understand it locally, they can't keep being expected to pay more and more for it. Whatever that is, whether it is research for, um, uh, for, for old and new diseases or for basic services, we have to help people understand what those challenges are. So I'm hoping we're pushing more local. I think in the health bill, again, again, I recommend reading it all, you know, the Hansard debates, our move towards um, locally elected chairs, proper integration locally. I don't think it is the total answer to productivity. We, we might come on to that. Um, but, but picking up some of that uh, as the bill goes forward, I think, is really where we are. And, I, and I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. I think that's a good place. We need to start talking about outcomes, health inequalities, public health, um, and community and primary care. That's the other big, big problem with this bill. It really does look at big hospitals and the money. Um, and that is a, I think that's a mistake. Sean, would you like to come in on that? Um, yeah, very briefly. I, th I think there's probably a lot I agree with Karen on there. I think uh, at Cancer Research UK, we've been encouraged, you know, John and the team have taken a very proactive position on prevention and I think have listened very carefully, not just to us, but to others and um, around how important those early years are as well. So I think there's, with all these things, as much as we're looking across the health system for integration, I also look across labor for integration across policy areas so you know whether it's child health whether it is science and research and whether it is health policy that there needs to be a thread running through those which i think i'm hearing this week or hearing i'm seeing this week um so pleased around john's early adoption around support for junk uh, ban on junk food marketing to children which we know is an an element but not a single answer on how we address childhood obesity um we know that 
John's also been very supportive around public health measures and, and one of the, the, the points we've discussed with him before is around um, the smoke-free ambition and in the absence of further funding for public health, the opportunity to see whether we could introduce a tobacco levy on tobacco manufacturers' profits. Tobacco manufacturers at the moment, you'll have read, want to be part of the public health solution. There's lots of ethical issues and challenges around how appropriate that is to be part of the solution here while you're marketing cigarettes abroad. But if they want to be part of the solution, a tobacco levy, which I think is a policy Labour are interested in looking at, is one where you could actually start to generate funds that could be implemented locally in the way Karen talks around to address some of those challenges. So I think, to answer your question, I think Labour has made strong progress. I think there's more to do as always. And as charities, we'll always be knocking on the door with new ideas. But I think we're moving in the right direction. Fiona, would you like to come in with some thoughts from the Alzheimer's space? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously we heard from Jonathan earlier around, you know, that focus on dementia research, but equally in the kind of big steps forward around social care, which I think are really welcomed. But um, dementia is so complex, it will need a kind of a multiplicity of approaches. So this joined up piece around thinking about risk reduction, because we know about a third of cases of dementia could be prevented in the future. So, and some of that are linked to inequalities around kind of how... Uh, um, access to education from early years. So I think this cross kind of um, portfolio, cross government initiatives, I think are going to be very, very important. And I just want to pick up on this point about integration because um, having worked for most of my career in the NHS, it's like archipelagos of islands of different parts across the NHS, so primary, community, mental health. So that connectivity is going to be incredibly important um, because we know with dementia is that 850,000 people now, that number set to rise to a million. Uh, in very short order and much more in the future as we have an ageing population. So that connected thoughts around housing, I think particularly is in really, really important for this, uh, for our community. Um, but equally just that ambition, uh, because we spoke to Jonathan um, in only just last week actually and brought people affected by dementia to, uh, to speak to him and recognising it's more than just social care as an issue. It's the fact that many are not getting the diagnosis at the right time. They're not getting that seamless um, journey into the support that they need. Um, so good steps forward, but you know, really keen to continue working with Labour to get this politically on the agenda. Fantastic. Um, I'm keen to bring some people in for some questions. We've got one, one hand um, at the back there, so um, we should have a roving mic. Thank you. Um, the only rule is just to state your name and your organisation, please. No question too outrageous. Okay. okay. Um, my name <laughs> is Jennifer Neff, and yeah. I'm from a tech for good company called Elemental Software. And firstly, I wanted to say thank you so much. There's so much going on, and when you make a decision to go to a session, when you think this has been well worth it, um, so thank you so much so far. Um, my question is, I suppose it's a statement and a question, but do you know much around social prescribing and the role that that plays in health and social care? There's lots going on. Um, as well in terms of the digital side of things too. It's the evidence and the data has been gathered to show the effectiveness and the difference it's making. Mm -hmm. And there's some great examples in, in dementia and, and yeah. different localities. Mm -hmm. um, and then just in my own experience, I found it quite, it's getting easier in terms of bringing innovation and ideas forward. Um, we're working with a lot of CCGs and, and things like that. So it's, it's not an easy road, but you know, it's great then when you get some traction. But um, so I'd love to just hear your feedback on social prescribing. That's great. And was there another hand up as well? Just the gentleman in front. Jen, we might use your um, quote, if you don't mind, on our fringe guide next year. So thank you very much for the endorsement. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes, I come to you as someone that is older at the moment using the NHS specialty for Parkinson's disease for 10, 10 years, which is, I went through the pandemic, which left me also with sciatica and I'm able to walk. I'm also, my, my mother has got, has got Alzheimer's. And my father, is, she's 84. My, my father, who's 90, has to change her bandages because the NHS won't actually change his bandages. How's, any, how's someone expect to do it? I also come from you from the point of view of working in within the NHS because I was the senior test manager within the Scottish system. They don't actually talk to their system for every six months because it's so bad. You have to wait to, to, to get everything goes through the system. So you've got the fragmentation there. You've got the fragmentation between Scotland, England and Wales. You've got Nicola Elwood Surgeon in the SNP. He's only concerned about um, a referendum about separation and pumping money from the NHS budget into that, that thing. 
basically. So all these things up today as a user. We find these in the pandemonium we have forgotten about. All this technology, so I'm sorry, it doesn't wear with us. I can't use a computer, how am I going to get on? My wife is blind here. She's been blind for 30 years. She can't use the computer. How is she going to get, make a complaint? How is she going to uh, repeat prescriptions? But they insist to do that. So all these things are fragmented. I don't think anybody actually comes and asks us with patients, the users, etc. What's going on? So the people at the top need to come down and work with the people at the bottom rather than the other way around. Thank you. And then just one question at the front. Gentleman, uh, Red Drop. Uh, my name is Adnan Gajak, and I'm from Siemens Engineers. So I work at Mount Vernon Cancer Hospital. Um, what I would highlight uh, on this policy exchange forum is uh, there's a backlog of 180,000 cancer patients uh, post COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, do we have any policy to deal with this issue? Because at the moment, NHS and <coughs> the systems are heavily stressed. And uh, thank you, Sean. It was really great to listen to you because I also work as a cancer technologies engineer. Uh, but I would just add to your so you mentioned MRI and CT. Uh, that would fall somewhere in conventional imaging and uh, slight overlap with the physiological imaging that we use for cancer mm. patients. But it's the PET CT uh, and uh, cyclotron technology and proton therapy that's needed in the UK to be supported at all levels and in various knowledge ba uh, knowledge based domains. <coughs> and finally, uh, the role of AI in medicine. Because that gonna, that's going to help us to reduce these backlogs uh, to expedite any diagnosis or treatment processes. So are we having some policy for that as a, as a party? Please don't. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for your question. So a, a lot there, social prescribing, the Scottish system and, and fragmentation and the sort of role of technology in the digitally excluded and then uh, looking at the big backlogs. Um, Louis, could I bring you in at this moment? Thanks, Rob. Yes. Um, maybe just to start with the, the, the backlog question. Um, I think COVID, the experience of the last 18 months, could be thought of as the acute phase. And actually what we're now entering is the chronic phase. And in lots of ways, this chronic phase is going to be even more challenging, I think, for the healthcare system mm -hmm. than, than even the last 18 months have been. Publicly, I think we're at five and a half million people in England on a waiting list. By the end of the year, estimates are putting that in double-figure millions. You're getting close to, to a point where a third of the adult population is waiting for some kind of hospital appointment. And that's just clearly not sustainable. And I think that's going to drive, uh, it's going to have to, to drive a lot of change. And, and to, the, to the point about innovation in the NHS, I think that will be the big driver. It will have to innovate to solve this problem. On the question of AI, I, I think actually there's a set of basics that need to be done before you can get to the fancy stuff. I think just bringing information together is, is, is where it starts. You can't develop AI algorithms and models unless you have clean and harmonized data. And the fragmentation means that's just not there. You don't have the longitudinal multimodal patient data asset on which those kinds of models we train. So to take a very concrete example, it, you can't at the moment bring together imaging data with the full primary care record. Um, you don't have that longitudinal picture combined with the diagnostics. And until those sorts of basic building blocks are in place and are, do, are done easily and you know, sort of as business as usual, I think the, the, the miracle of AI is, is some way off as a result. Um, I think also it's, a, it's an absolute moral imperative to solve the backlog. Um, Sean, you'll probably have this number at your fingertips, but I remember being astonished at the percentage of cancer that is diagnosed on an elective pathway. Um, I mean, West Streeting, the MP, is a, is a good example of that. He goes into hospital for a kidney stone and gets diagnosed with kidney cancer at 37. And the longer you keep those tens of millions of people waiting for their hospital appointments, the later the stage of cancer that will get diagnosed and the survival rates will be affected accordingly. And so I think it's not impossible to imagine a world where over the next year or two you start to see a lot of people in their 40s who would ordinarily have very good survival rates in hospital with terminal cancer. Uh, so, it, not a cheerful note, but I think there's genuinely no bigger issue that the country faces right now than the elective backlog. Fiona. 
Um, I first, I want to address the gentleman because I think your story is absolutely heartbreaking and is exactly what we hear from thousands and thousands of people through our helpline. I mean, Alzheimer's Society was contacted six million times uh, from over the last um, 18 months during the pandemic because exactly stories of that you're telling us. And I think for us, the fact that um, the impact on the individual and the family around them is extraordinary. But actually, if you take this up to a slightly bigger level in terms of, say, an integrated care system, we know that the fact that someone's not getting someone to come in and help them to dress, you know, we, we know we're getting more likely to have falls, we, um, urinary tract infections that are not being picked up because someone's not being able to have a drink. And that all impacts on the, health, on the NHS. So people are ending up upping an A&E. Um, so, so there's a bigger system issue that kind of takes up from thousands of individual stories like you. The other piece I wanted to say about um, dementia in terms of backlog, um, the national target for a dementia diagnosis is 67%. So I just want to let, let that sink in. We only expect two thirds of people with dementia to actually get a diagnosis. And through, the, through this whole pandemic, the diagnosis rate has fallen through the fallen through because the mental health assessment, the memory assessment clinics have not been open in the way that people are can access, access them. People are scared to go to their GPs and the GPs are not referring. So there's a whole ish number of issues that are coming onto that, which means in some parts of our country, only 52% of people are, are, of the local population are getting a diagnosis based on prevalence. So there are tens of thousands of people waiting. And from a dementia perspective, you know, we've just heard about the big elective challenge around cancer, it's not top of the list and priorities. So what's happening is that people are getting diagnosed later, often in crisis, and then the ability to even give them the psychosocial interventions that we know can help are, are not there. So just the final bit about social prescribing. Yes, social prescribing is one element that can be used for people with dementia currently because we don't have those um, medicalised treatments. Um, so things like arts therapy, um, uh, singing therapy, gar and all those kind of things are really good to keep people connected to the world. Um, but quite frankly, it's, it's a sticking plaster and we need to see huge transformation, not only at the social care system, but this integration around people affected by dementia. Karen, would you like to come in now? Um, yes, well, um, if I start, um, I'll start with the, um, the tech and social prescribing. We, we, we love social prescribing in Bristol. Um, um, I think we were quite well ahead of the curve, um, certainly even in my time um, working locally in the service, and it's really come into its own during the pandemic. Um, because I think we had lots of those basic uh, routes and people in place to pick up, particularly around things like isolation and knowing where people were. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, w I would agree um, that you know it, it's not going to answer some of the, 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 the sort of higher order issues, if you like. But that's not what it's designed to do. Um, I think it's good public health work, and I'm a big fan of good public health work. So let that work. But it's what, what happens next. How do you step up to the next? To to the next bit of that, that's really, uh, really important. Um, so your, your story, thank you for sharing. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, a f I'm both a fan of devolution, but in my uh, healthcare work, I'm also part of something called the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, and we do a lot of work in committees in different parts of the British Isles across Britain and Ireland. And one of the things that we've really lost um, through devolution and devolution of health is uh, knowledge and understanding of what's going on in Scotland and in Wales. We are essentially the same population, um, so we're a very rich source of data-driven uh, research, etc. But um, that, that's the disconnect, um, I think, is really problematic about in, in terms of um, how we are monitoring health, how we, how we collect data, what we do with it, the different rules around that. I know the chief medical officers do meet and they do share. Again, in the pandemic, that's something that's come into sharp focus as different people gave different advice and different administrations took different tacks. But we do need to find a way of um, not undermining devolution as a political concept, but making sure we don't you know, throw out the baby with the bathwater in terms of how we can use our population, a large population, to understand and drive better, um, better health. On the digital exclusion, it is, it, it is, look, it's, it is just really difficult, isn't it? Um, it, it's both it's both the way forward and fantastic and it, it, it it's a real problem for many many people i know that in, in my own family um and um we, we just have to keep trying to make that work 
um, it, it is here to stay, obviously. It will get more, and we need to find other ways of reducing the exclusion element of that, which we will um, over time. The backlog, as I said in my introductory remarks, um, recovery, as I called it, um, of course it is the issue. I mean, we, we're in the sad position as a party of not having to have to do much about this because we won't be in government um, for the recovery. <laughs> so um, the short, short answer to that. But let's look what we did when we were in government. Um, and um, I'm very proud to be part of that time. I was a, a non-executive director of trust at the time. The phenomenal resource and targeting of reducing waiting lists and waiting times, you know, it was really quite extraordinary. But it was hugely expensive. It was expensive in terms of money, it's expensive in terms of staffing, in terms of management time. Um, the clinical and the cler clerical validation of lists is a massive undertaking, as well as, as has been talked about, what we find in the system, because people don't you know, present with one, where's has been the exa a good example, people don't present with one neat diagnosis that can be neatly treated. We're complicated human beings, aren't we? And the government has zilch zero nothing to say about it it really is quite shocking now that is not a sustainable position because we're already hearing people's dissatisfaction about access um, we all know I, I suspect everyone in this room has got experience personal experience of um, either the possibly have lost someone um, but certainly will have had somebody uh, waiting for diagnosis or who's been ill or is, is is now on a waiting list so politically that will rise to the top and the government will have to do something, but they have no ambition, and they need to dust off what we did at that time, um, which, and this is much worse, um, and really give clinicians and managers the resource and support to tackle this as a particular problem because it is so enormous. And it goes back to my introductory point, which is if the system is not good, if it, you don't have that access, if it doesn't respond to you, then you will not want to pay more for it, and that's why I fundamentally believe that we need to educate and support people about that but be very honest about the cost and what you get get for it to bring people with us thanks Karen I'm keen to bring in some more people for questions but Sean would you like to just respond to any of those um, questions? very briefly I mean I think I agree with most of what people said the thing I find really interesting is uh, Louis reflections around data um, it's really untapped it's un an untapped element in terms of the patient journey as you as you as you explain um, having to tell your story four times to everyone you meet and why isn't there a central record through that. But also from a research perspective, you know, our ability to use predictive techniques to understand high risk uh, amongst the population, how we can use that better to manage resource, how we can w use that better to intervene at an earlier stage is absolutely critical. I don't think the government has won the public trust on health data. And for me, that has to be one of the big challenges for the year ahead because that's the thing that we're going to slip behind on. And that's the thing. There's the privacy issues, of course. There are concerns about how that data is used. But actually, from a research perspective, that data is priceless in able to understand our own bodies, understand our risk factors, and then understand what we need to do about it. So I just wanted to highlight that point because I think it's really, really important. Thank you for your um, comments around cancer. Yeah, I didn't read out the full list of where <laughs> money needs to go, but the proton um, beam therapy, I think you mentioned, really, really interesting. We have a proton beam therapy um, a, a center in Manchester, which I can talk to you about afterwards, which is um, really um, delivering some really breakthrough stuff. Thanks, thanks, Sean. Um, are there any more questions from the audience? We've got a, a hand up over there, and then we'll go to the gentleman on the far side. Hi, uh, my name is Fiona Collins, and I'm um, chair of Cheshire and Amersham CLP. Um, uh, I'm a lawyer by trade, and uh, I haven't ordered a lateral flow test um, online because I wasn't happy to sign up to NHS Digital's privacy policy. Um, it's opaque. Um, you've talked about needing to have a um, have you know have a set of good data that uh, it's clear that we're, we're in a dig digital age I, I'm not pretending that we're not but I, I do think it's quite simple people need to be told what's happening to their data before they're willing to hand it over and there's a lot of people that aren't willing to hand it over um, and with all due respect to the to the sponsors of this event Palantir's record on its use of data is not without controversy um, so how the question is is how what steps are you taking to um, win the public's trust um, of how 
how patient data is used. Um, I don't want to find out that my 82-year-old father can no longer go on holiday because he can't get insurance because his, his health data has been used by insurance companies to exclude him from travelling anymore. Thank you. And then we'll just go over to the... Uh, there was a hand up on the far side. Thank you. Uh, Neil Wilson from Mid Derbyshire CLP. I, I also work for the NHS as well. My question is around uh, ICSs. Do you, do you think they will deliver what they tend to deliver, or they or they're more just tinkering again around the edges and not haven't really got the, the teeth to, to do what they intend to do? Great. Thank, thanks, Neil. Um, Karen, would you like to perhaps come back? You obviously you've been looking over all of the clauses, assessing amendments, etc., scrutinising the minister. Are ICS is going to deliver? Um, well, the funny thing about the ICS is that there's no definition of what they are. So, so no, they don't know, and, and I agree they, they don't have teeth because um, uh, you can't have teeth if you don't even know what you are, and that's that's they they haven't defined them. We're having this debate about. Um, centralisation and permissiveness is the new buzzword, um, um, and the health service wanted permissiveness. Um, and, I, and I say, and I say to the health service leaders, well, that's that's fine, but you want accountability, which is why I come back to my favourite hobby horse of having elected local chairs that the public can hold to account. Um, my local health community spends upwards of 1.5 billion pounds. My police and crime commissioner, I think, is about 300 grand, and I'm electing a police and crime commissioner. But NHS England decide who runs. You know, upwards of 1.5 billion pound in my community. That's just that's just not right. It's just not right. Um, so elected chairs, I put forward proposals for non-executive directors, uh, pure scrutiny about who, who makes decisions, challenge chief executives, that sort of thing to bring the two together. We've got very complicated system with health and well-being boards in these new organisations. They still have the same statutory powers. That's not worked through, um, and the government's not looking like it's going to change that. All of that said. Um, it's the right direction. It is the right direction. Um, and it is good, woohoo, to be getting rid of the Lansley Act. And I think as a party, I'd like us to be waving our bags and flanner, uh, banners and saying, you know, we said it wouldn't work. We said it was a terrible waste of time and money. We said it was the wrong direction. Everybody, everybody told the government not to do it. They even had a pause. And it is a phenomenal failure of the political system that that act went ahead. Um, and we should be really, you know, claiming the credit for getting rid of it. It never worked, um, and we have removed competition as the driving force in the health service. We are all talking about collaboration, and that is a, also a phenomenal achievement that we should be thinking about. What next? What does collaboration really mean? How do you get grip in the system? So it is the right direction of travel. If we could get some more grip for local people, accountability, it would help us with this very thorny issue of data and, and, and trust. I think, Sean, you said that. Um, because again, in the pandemic, haven't we learnt about science and research like most of us have perhaps never learnt before? Um, I think I, I, I take the lady's point about not signing up, absolutely. Um, Many of us have signed up, though, and just and then and it's interesting talking to younger people. I mean, I think they sign away everything, um, and then they make rue that day. So it is it is a, tr a tricky one for us to, to really get our um, our heads around. Um, and again, using the distrust that has happened in the care data. Um, when, when, you know, we looked at the care data stuff a few years ago and everyone just rolled straight back. And you have to take that very seriously. You also have to recognise where the interest is in the system and who's speaking on behalf of who and who wants to have access and control that data that we give up. But again, uploading the NHS app, looking back over your consultations over 20 years, forgetting when you went to a GP. I think, mm. you know, people, I'm in my mid-50s, people have found that, you know, quite empowering, actually. Um, and and a real step forward. So I, I think I, I do think it's all about that debate, having local, trusted people talking about that. But do I trust the government with my data? No, <laughs> short answer. But we do need to. We do need to get to that position. Louis. Thank you. Um, I actually agree with you quite strongly. Um, as a citizen, I would love to be able to open the NHS app and see all the purposes to which my personal data is being processed by the NHS. Technically, that's possible. Um, we make software that would make that possible. The question, though, is to your point about NHS Digital, as the data controller in the sort of technical GDPR sense of the data controller, 
it, it is on the controller to determine that, not the position that we play, which is a data processor. Um, as a company, we have the same relationship to our customers' data as, as Microsoft Excel does. Um, we don't, Microsoft doesn't have access to the contents of an Excel document on your desktop. Uh, you own that data, you own the logic, and whatever it is you do in there, you're simply licensing a set of tools to make it easier, faster, to do your job. And that's the, that is the business model we operate on. We don't sell data, we don't harvest data, we don't broker data. It's always the controller's data that they process using our software. So, speaking personally, I'd be very, very much in favor of that. And I think, to, to, to your point, Karen, um, I think it boils down to choice. You need to give citizens choice. That rests on transparency mm -hmm. and ultimately then accountability. And people should be allowed to vote with their feet. No. It's fake news. Great. Um, Fiona and Sean, would either of you like to come in on this? Um, I wanted to pick up on the point around integrated care systems because, uh, because I suppose the, the optimist in me thinks that dementia is the pathway or people affected by dementia are the ones that need integration more than anything because it is about all the different parts of the health system and social care that will support them and that just fundamentally isn't happening at the moment. Um, but for good integration, we're going to need a couple of things. We're going to need social care reform and investment, so the social care side of it is working. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need social care to be equal partners um, at the table in these integrated care systems. And I think one of our concerns is that it will become another mechanism for, for the NHS. So I think if we really do want to kind of take the vision and go forward, we need to kind of make sure that social care um, is at the heart of it. And I think ensuring that those stories and what's really understood about the individuals that are accessing um, the different parts of the system are understood. And that goes to your part, Karen, about I mean, how do you get that voice really heard at that local level? And then in terms of the health data, um, I think just from a dementia perspective, um, we have so little data to understand about dementia. Uh, there's, there's no registries within the NHS, we've got very little in the NHS, and we've got pretty much nothing in social care. So for transformation, and particularly for local commissioners, local service providers, and then for the kind of the future thinking around research and innovation, there's something around getting much more robust health um, data um, for people with dementia. And one of the things that we're calling for is for a dementia observatory, so really kind of brings us all together, but also having a really strong kind of patient experience, um, uh, regular annual um, analysis as well, because that's not happening. And we feel that Actually, there's more needs to be done. Um, but the final bit of that, there has to be trust. Um, there absolutely has to be trust, and we need to have an open, honest debate and conversation about um, why should you give your, your, your data and what will it enable and what does it mean for you. So um, far more to be done um, on, in this space. Sean, would you like to come in on that? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, interestingly, both these questions, and more broadly, you know, have circled around trust and accountability. Um, the care bill, uh, the health care bill, primarily really lacking some of those elements, I would say. Um, working back, I, I totally agree with you on the data. You know, I think as, as, a, as a citizen, um, as someone who was CIUK, you know, I want people to know what's happening with the data, but we need to better tell the story, you know, and that hasn't happened. And I don't, and I don't, I don't think that's just a government-led thing. I think charities have a really important role to play in that as well. I would probably argue that charities are more trusted to tell that story, um, and so I think we need to find a way of doing that because the benefits can be really significant. Um, but notwithstanding all the other concerns that people have, rightly have, around privacy. Um, ICS is, I think, a really interesting. I think you're right. I, I, I agree with Karen that there's a move in the right direction. I think certainly when I worked, in my previous role, I worked in children's palliative care, and the journeys and stories that parents would tell about how fragmented the system was, how different the system was depending on where you live, were, were terrifying, awful. Um, and so I think any, a move to kind of work on a geographic area which makes more sense, is more sensible, that allows us to integrate in the way that is hoped, I think is really, really positive. You know, I would also make a plea that that needs to include things like cancer alliances and other existing regional structures as well to make those work. But I think the, uh, the proof will be in the pudding a little bit, I think. 
Um, the one point around the health and care bill that plays back to this issue around uh, accountability and just to circle back to workforce is you know, there is a commitment in that bill that the government will report every parliament on the workforce needs um, for the NHS and we've joined with the Health Foundation, the King's Fund and other charities calling for that to be an annual report that is independent because I think that's at the heart of the, the, the trust and the accountability element that really talks about what the NHS is going to need in the next three, five, seven, ten years time. And if we have that as part of the legislation, we'll pick up with this uh, afterwards, you know, then that does give us a basis of data that we can work to. And at the moment, there isn't a consistent basis of data that we can work to. Great. We're um, just a couple of minutes from the end, but I want to give a final chance if anyone has a burning question in the audience they would like to ask. Um, at the back there, just wait one second, a microphone will be brought to you. Uh, thank you. Um, I just had a quick question. Could, could you introduce yourself, please? I'm Hannah. I work in kind of healthcare comms. Um, I just wanted to ask, considering in the last general election, obviously, a key point of kind of Labour's campaign was highlighting concerns about a US-UK trade deal and the impacts that would have on patient data. So I just wanted to ask, you know, what do you think is the best way for Labour to kind of encourage people to provide their data to the NHS that, to kind of you know, reap all the benefits we've been discussing today, but at the same time, being able to highlight concerns, for instance, in that trade bill as well, and just how those two kind of two key points, how do you think, what's the best approach to kind of both um, kind of take that forward? Well, I know there's a bit of speculation about the likelihood of a US-UK trade deal recently <laughs> when the Prime Minister that. visited. Would anyone like to come in on that point? Well, I'm happy to, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, 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 the success of the campaign is that the government have realised this is a real problem and then said they'd rule it out. Um, so, you know, again, good success for people raising things and campaigns. But it, I, and I think so we've all said it's the trusting, and I, and I think what Sean said about charities and other people being able to explain this story. Um, so that I w was in the service when we talked about a care, care, care data uh, stuff first off what, in 2012. Um, and I knew there was a good story to be told. Um, it seemed absolutely sensible to me to start forming primary and secondary uh, care data and smoothing out those pathways. Mm. And it is essential for, for, for good pathways, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but absolutely saw, having always been politically active, how, as a, how, how that was not just not going to work. Uh, you know, and actually, the local NHS is not trusted to do it either. So the NHS sort of bureaucracy saying you must do this, nobody knows what that is either. So, um, you know, from our charity colleagues here, explaining what it means to, to your dad, you know, to, mm -hmm. to your child, um, you, know, you know, why it's important. And ultimately, said, what is going to happen to it? And, you know, the point you made from Ch Cheshire and Amersham, absolutely well made. And that's the way we as a party need, need to address that as well. Great. Um, oh, and one final question over on the side. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, a question for everybody, perhaps particularly for Karen. I mean, sorry, my name is David Goodhart. I work at Policy Exchange. Um, do you think it's a kind of problem that the NHS is, re and indeed social care, are sort of uh, the national religion um, that, um, uh, you know, and that everybody that works in it is, is, is an angel or a saint? Um, and that actually, you know, we know, uh, you know, from our own personal experience, um, you know, that, that, you know, if you're not visiting your elderly mother in the care home or even in the NHS, then actually, you know, they won't necessarily get the right pills and so on and so forth. There are enormous inconsistencies in the quality of care, even in the same hospital, in the same ward. Um, and we sort of, because it's become such a sacred thing, we don't really talk about that. All we ever really talk about is how much more money the NHS is going to get. I'm, I'm happy to. I, I, I do. I do think it's a problem, um, and, and I think it, it um, damages people's individuals' autonomy and rights to, to act, actively challenge and do the best sometimes for the people that they love and care for. And I don't think it's helpful, um, actually, for the service. It's why I so strongly believe in accountability at all levels and better governance, a bit of a, you know, a techie word, in order to do that, to empower people to, to, to make it better, to make outcomes better and where things go wrong, to be able to say that. Um, and I think we need to, 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 to get back to that position. 
Thank you. So I'll just very briefly go along the panellists and ask them to um, share any final thoughts. And uh, just to try and be precise, if, if you could have one thing, one change to the NHS and social care system that you think could unlock the most benefit that could make us the envy of the world, what would that be? So I'll start with Louis on the left. You've got to be, you've got to be picky. Um, I think actually partly inspired by some of the reflections on the panel, I think having that conversation um, about trust and how do you bring the public with you on some of these big questions, um, both structural but also the information that's available to the NHS, how does that get leveraged, not just for the internal operational benefits that will be derived from that, but for the next generation of treatments, the discoveries that will be made if that data can be brought together, cleaned, harmonized, and made available to the world of research. Great, and Fiona? So I think from a dementia perspective particularly, and I think in the context of an aging population and the numbers of people affected by dementia are going to increase, I do think it's that integration across health and social care and seeing social care as equal partners at the table, particularly in these integrated care systems, because that ultimately I think will give that kind of seamless transition once you have your diagnosis into the support that you need um, and, you know, I'm a huge optimist of research coming through, but that's not going to have a cure in the next year or so, certainly in the next five years. So we're going to have to have that seamless transition into support. And I think getting that right at the integrated care system is going to be critical. Karen? Um, so just to be clear that I think it is the best system in the world. I'm, you know, enormously proud to have worked as part of it. And I desperately, desperately want to keep it. And I want to keep it universal. Um, and I want it to move with us in times. And one of the reasons I'm so critical about things like uh, putting challenge in the system is because I think it's the only way to do that, to sustain it for the 21st century. So for me, it is about empowering people and better governance and better local governance. Is that one thing? Or is that like the four things? Is that a politician's answer? We'll, we'll let it slide. Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. You're the MP on the panel, so you get away with that. Sean? Uh, I won't get away with that. Exactly. Um, one thing um, is workforce. There's not enough people working in the NHS to meet demand. And in diagnostics, that's really felt powerfully. It's the reason why, as I said before, that cancer survival lags behind other comparable countries. Compare us and Australia, I'll show you the stats, you know, where they've really made an effort and they've really made a difference. You know, we can build as many hospitals, we can refurbish as many hospitals, whatever your party line is on the hospital rebuilding, pro rebuilding program, but ultimately planes need pilots. You know, we need people in the system to do the diagnostics, to do the treatments, and to get people through. Uh, that wasn't a problem just for now, that was before, but that's what the CSR needs to deliver. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Well, at the start, we asked what's gone wrong and how do we put it right. We've got four suggestions. We've got trust, integration, empowerment, and workforce, which feels like a good shopping list. Good, so good thank you very much for, for listening to your questions, <laughs> and a big thanks to Palantir, our sponsors for today. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good.